Welcome and good morning, everyone. My name is Allison Lake. I'm the Executive Director of Westchester Children's Association. And I'm so excited to have you join us this morning for our 2021 Advocacy Breakfast. Normally, we would be around a table together enjoying a nice hot breakfast of eggs and bacon and croissants, but not this year. So I hope you have at least had the opportunity to make yourself a nice cup of coffee or tea. I'm really excited to present this year's topic, education and equity during the pandemic and beyond. I want to, at this point, thank our corporate sponsors, PCSB Bank, for their support of this event. Of this event. We really could not do our advocacy work without corporate sponsors, so thank you. Today is really the start of our conversation and actions that we all need to take. I want to thank our presenters in advance, Congressman Bowman and Chancellor Young, for being the thought leaders that they are to really give us direction on how we can improve education equity for children here in Westchester County. At this time, I would like to introduce a longtime friend, supporter, and leader at Westchester Children's Association, and that is our board president, Ann Umamoto. Thank you. Ann? Thank you, Allison, for that lovely introduction, and welcome to all of you for joining us at Westchester Children's Association Advocacy Morning. I hope that you are introducing yourselves to each other and letting us know where you came from in the chat box. For those of you who are using social media to share information about our event, please use the hashtag WCA Advocacy Breakfast. So hashtag WCA Advocacy Breakfast. I am from the Westchester Children's Association Board of Directors. We are advocates for children. We fight to improve the lives of Westchester's young people. By, we fight to improve the lives of Westchester's young people by shaping policies and programs to meet the needs of children and keeping their well being at the top of the public agenda. We want to thank the almost 1,000 parents who responded to our survey last year on remote learning. WCA and our remote learning work group include school districts, child advocates, and community organizations working together to ensure all of Westchester's children and their families have what they need to get the most out of remote learning. For this work, we have three priority areas. Priority area one, technology and internet access. So everyone has access to appropriate devices, training and tech support. Priority area two, remote learning support, including accommodations for students, and quality training for parents and guardians. And priority area three is mental health to address the mental, social, emotional impact of prolonged isolation and remote learning of students, faculty, and families. We invite you to join us. You can sign up for a remote learning, we can, you can sign a remote learning petition on Westchester Association's website and learn more about our organization and our remote learning agenda. Our URL is wca4kids.org. Just two quick reminders. If you have questions for the speakers, post them on the Q&A uh, box instead of the chat box. So that's either down below or above. And if you are tweeting, remember the hashtag WCA Advocacy Breakfast. I know that you are eager to hear from our speakers, and I am going to introduce now the two distinguished educators who have partnered with us to make this event happen, and they will introduce our distinguished speakers. So if you want to get to the core of the program, I will not be able to do justice to the accomplishments of these two women. Alexandria Connolly will introduce Congressional Representative Bowman. Dr. Connolly is currently Director of Equity, Inclusion, 
and Innovation at Nyack Public Schools. Before that, she was CEO of Culturally Responsive Environments and Disciplines, CREE. Tahira Dupree Chase will introduce Chancellor Young. Dr. Chase is superintendent of Greenberg Central School District. Before becoming superintendent, she was assistant superintendent of curriculum and instructions in the Greenberg School District. And now I turn you to Dr. Connolly. I have the pleasure of introducing my Congressman, Congressman Jamal Bowman, EDD, represents New York's 16th district, which includes the Northern Bronx and parts of Southern Westchester. Bowman was born and raised in New York City, spending his early years in public housing and rent control departments. After graduating from the University of New Haven, Rep Bowman began his career as a crisis intervention teacher in a Bronx public school and went to earn his master's degree in guidance counseling from Mercy College and a doctorate in education from Manhattanville College. In 2009, Bowman founded Cornerstone Academy for Social Action, a Bronx middle school where he served as principal for a decade and worked to center the voices, the cultural awareness and love. Bowman has also been an outspoken advocate for the Rethink Education, including ending state sanctioned yearly standardized tests. Bowman was elected to Congress in 2020 running on a platform of transformative progressive policies that will improve the lives of those who have been legislated out of the American dream. Congressman Bowman is dedicated to passing vision, visionary policies that infuse climate injustice and economics and racial justice and highlight the importance of research and investing in communities of color. Bowman lives in Yonkers, New York with his wife and children. Welcome Congressman Bowman. Good morning, Dr. Connolly. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. And I wanna tell everyone on this call, if you haven't had a chance to participate in one of Dr. Connolly's workshops, please make sure to sign up and register and do so. Uh, she came to my school, uh, I think it was a year before um, I decided to run for office and she did a, a culturally responsive workshop and she blew everyone away. And immediately after the workshop, I ran up to her to introduce myself and exchange numbers with her because that the work that she is doing is exactly the work we need uh, in our schools in the state and across the country particularly in this moment. And this is a pivotal moment uh, for all of us and for our children and for our country and for the world, quite frankly. We are now removed from four years of one of the worst presidents in our nation's history. And we are moving into a space where we have an opportunity to reimagine and repurpose and redesign our communities and our schools and really focus on how we're serving our most precious resource, which is our children. Uh, Whitney Houston told us a long time ago, children are the future. And that is true. Children are the future. Children are the present. Children are the foundation of our democracy. And we need to do everything in our power to make sure we are creating nurturing environments and nurturing homes for our children. So I'm excited to be here with you all. I'm, I'm incredibly humbled to be a member of Congress in this moment. I'm incredibly humbled that I was uh, voted in as the vice chair of the Ed and Labor Committee uh, in Congress, which is an exciting honor and privilege and gives me the opportunity to continue the good work I've done or tried to do over the last several years. I'm honored to be here with Dr. Lester Young, our new chancellor. Um, we were speaking prior to, to coming on to the call about Betty Rosa as our commissioner of education, Misha Ross Porter as our new uh, chancellor in New York City schools, Joe Biden as our new president. There's a lot of exciting things happen. So we cannot squander this moment. The first part of this American Rescue Plan, uh, President Biden's Build Back Better Plan, uh, is investing $130 billion in our K-12 schools, which gives and, and is equitably distributed, meaning, you know, there have been school districts that have been have received more resources in terms of funding uh, than some of our highest need school districts. So this money that's coming in is equitably distributed 
focused on Title I schools, and it gives us a chance and an opportunity to rethink, reimagine, and redesign what we do in our schools. So this is our moment to get it right. And for the record, one of the reasons why I, I have consistently pushed back against our overuse and misuse of standardized testing, not that I'm fully against standardized testing, because I'm not. They have a place in what we do in our schools. But overuse and misuse is what's been happening over the last 20 years, and we haven't gotten any closer to our goals, which is to close the achievement gap and to unlock the full potential of our kids. This is our moment to do that. I believe all children are brilliant and all children have the unlimited potential to change the world, to solve the problems of the world in which we currently exist. And in order to do that, we have to do a few things uh, well and a few things correctly. We have to provide nurturing and robust early childhood education from birth to age eight. Uh, we have to make our schools more focused on problem solving around project-based learning within the K-12 system. We have to help our students or put them in a position to work collaboratively and cooperatively and to unlock and tap into their curiosity. Children are naturally curious. They want to explore the world and we need to give them opportunities to do so. We have to bring back physical education, sports, music and the arts into our schools because they've been legislated out of our schools over the last several decades. We have to make sure that we are targeting students who have the most needs with smaller class sizes and individualized instruction. We need to make sure our communities are safe, both from an environmental standpoint, but also from a food security standpoint and a housing standpoint. We need to take a holistic approach with how we address the needs of our kids and our families, and we need to work together to do so. And this is our moment. The resources are coming in. This is a chance to reimagine re and redesign, but we have to continue to fight for what our children need and what our families need. And we have to fight whoever is in the way of us helping our children. We have to fight at a federal level, at a state level, at a county level, and at a local uh, municipality level. And I'm just excited to be in that fight with all of you. I thank you so much, WCA, for the work you're doing focused on our children. But as we focus on our children, we have to focus on our families. We have to focus on our communities. And we cannot take no for an answer. And we cannot accept half measures when it, when it comes to our children. So I look forward to continuing to be in the fight with all of you, with Dr. Young, and with educators across this country that know we can do better, we must do better, we should do better. And as we talk about equity, it's equity of resources in terms of dollars and cents. It's equity of resources in terms of materials that our kids need, both inside of school and outside of school. It's equity of resources in terms of broadband and Wi-Fi and access to technology. We introduced a bill a couple of weeks ago that provides broadband to 80 million additional uh, young people across the country. But it's also equity of ideas. Our kids, our communities have amazing ideas, but they never had the resources or rarely had the resources to make those ideas a reality. Now it's our job to unlock those, those ideas, to keep the resources coming in so those ideas can become a reality, so they can rebuild what has been broken and neglected in Yonkers, in Mount Vernon, in parts of New Rochelle, in Otsoning, in Port Chester, and in other parts of Westchester County that haven't always gotten the resources. As we focus on equity, we have to focus on those who have been most vulnerable historically. And I'm excited to be in that fight with you. Let's get it done. When we come together next year, there will be robust transformative change in the making. And it's gonna happen every year for the rest of our lives because that's what we have dedicated ourselves to. Peace and love everyone. Thank you so much. And I look forward to continuing to listen and learn and engage with you all. Um, uh, thank you. Uh Representative Congressman uh, Bowman, it, it's just such an honor to have you. I'll quickly introduce myself. Um, 
and my name is Martha Sood. I am acting as the moderator today, and I am a board member for Westchester Children's Association and a longtime educator for um, at-risk um, immigrant children in urban spaces and urban communities and um, uh, with uh, social emotional learning. Um, at this time, I'm going to pass the baton to um, uh, Dr. Uh, Chase, who will introduce uh, Chancellor Young. And again, um, Congressman Bowman, thank you so much for just setting the optimistic tone of the hard fight that we have to do um, and approaching this in a holistic manner so that we can level the playing field uh, for all the kids and the families. It, it's a we're at, a, we're at a critical juncture here, and we, we are very grateful for your leadership and uh, for setting the tone of optimism, but letting us know that, you know, we still have the hard fight. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Chase, for introducing now Chancellor Young. Powerful words, Congressman, and I look forward to joining that fight with you on behalf of our children. Good morning, Westchester Children's Association Board of Directors, Executive Director Allison Lake Moore, the hardworking staff of the Westchester Children's Association, and to all distinguished guests who have gathered this morning for the sake of our precious children. I have the esteemed pleasure of introducing our next speaker, the Chancellor of the New York State Education Department and State University of New York Board of Regents, Dr. Lester W. Young, Jr. Chancellor Young is the first African-American chancellor of the state board region since its establishment in 1784 and is well revered for his steadfast commitment to equitable opportunities for all students. Chancellor Young's more than 50 year commitment to public service is guided by creating opportunities where every student can be successful. He walks the talk. In this day and age, when the phrase of equity, diversity, and inclusion are fashionable, I witnessed firsthand Chancellor Young's commitment to his own guiding principle by his fervent leadership in establishing the state's My Brother's Keeper initiative, which aims to improve outcomes for young men of color. Because of, Chancellor's Young, because of Chancellor Young's leadership, New York remains one of the few states in the nation to have the My Brother's Keeper initiative enacted into law. My school district in particular, the Greenberg Central School District, has benefited tremendously from Chancellor Young's leadership in this initiative. And now, Chancellor Young's bio. Lester W. Young Jr. is serving his third term as the Regent at Large, the University of the State of New York. In January, Dr. Young was unanimously elected by his peers to be Chancellor. Currently, he co-chairs the P-12 Education Committee and chairs the Regent Work Group to improve outcomes for boys and young men of color, as well as the Early Childhood Work Group. A career educator, Dr. Young has served as a teacher, guidance counselor, supervisor of special education, principal, associate commissioner with the New York State Education Department and superintendent of Community School 13. A recognized educational leader and innovator, he was responsible for establishing some of the more successful high schools and middle schools in New York City and reproducing the nationally recognized algebra project. Corner School Development Program and the Obama Foundation, My Brother's Keeper Initiative. He is a life member of the National Alliance of Black School Educators and Alpha Phi Alpha Incorporated Fraternity. Dr. Young volunteers as a mentor to principals and aspiring leaders throughout New York City. He has been recognized by many local, national education and civic education organizations for his professional contributions. This bio, ladies and gentlemen, does not fully describe the impact Chancellor Young has made in the state of New York and throughout the country. When I asked him about adding more to his bio, he said to me, it is great to acknowledge what I've done, but it's better to pay attention to what I am doing and will do. 
Ladies and gentlemen, in my conversation with educational leaders throughout the state and beyond about the impact of Chancellor Young's work and recent appointment, I recall some describe Chancellor Young as an advocate for the underrepresented, an equity warrior, a visionary leader, an extraordinary educator, official and unofficial mentor to many, and my favorite one, the godfather of my brother's keeper. All comments were stated with appreciation and admiration. I too share those sentiments. Chancellor Young has been an inspiration to me in more ways than he will ever know. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege this morning to present to you our New York State Education Department and State University of New York, Chancellor yes, Lester W. Young, Jr. Well, thank you uh, and good morning. And Dr. Chase, thank you very much for that more than uh, generous introduction. Uh, you, you can't imagine how much those kind words uh, have meant to me. And I'd like to thank uh, Executive Director Lake and the entire Westchester Children's Association and team uh, for having the foresight and leadership to bring us together this morning. Uh, I would also, I believe my colleague uh, who actually represents uh, Westchester on the Board of Regents, Dr. Fran Wills is also uh, with us this morning. And of course, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, recognize the eloquence and brilliance of our Congressman, Jamal Bowman. Uh, I have said earlier, and I continue to say every chance uh, that I have, that our future is definitely secure with the kind of leadership that Congressman Bowman has been able to demonstrate and will demonstrate on behalf of children and families of, of New York, but more importantly, uh, what he will do for young people across this nation. Uh, I would like to just place my comments this morning in, in a context. Uh, one of my heroes, uh, the, the late President Nelson Mandela reminded us that there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. And, and so I, I have always taken that to heart. And while I won't talk about the history of how we have treated our children. Um, what I would like to do is really explore with you what I think is what is possible. Uh, also, uh, th this is an important moment and an important topic, this whole issue of, of equity. But just to put it uh, plainly, uh, a couple of things have happened in this moment. You know, we've had the convergence of the pandemic along with what I've described as, as the brutal and senseless killing of black and brown men and women occurring and observed in real time, right? Right in front of us. And, and those of us in leadership positions, um, you know, those of us who are parents are are challenged with helping our young people make sense of a very senseless situation. And so what occurs to me is something that the famous Nigerian writer, Chimamande Ngozi Ndiche reminds us of, and that is that this single story the single story narrative that's presented regarding many of our young people, particularly our most vulnerable, particularly our black, brown, um, Latinx, Asian, indigenous and poor families. Um, that single story does not have to be the definitive story. And some have suggested that in this moment, we need to have a paradigm shift. And, and so people talk about reform. Um, and, and what 
I would say are a couple of things. I think sometimes what we have to do is be more respectful and aware of our historical moments and understand that because we're at a time and experiencing something that we've never experienced before, this is not the first time that we've been challenged by injustice. This is not the first time that we've been challenged by national and international crisis. And so what were those things that provided us with, with a way out? Uh, the great historian, Dr. Vanessa Sedell Walker reminds us that during these periods, there was always an emphasis on the well-being of children and understanding that a student's success depends more than on just schooling, right? So that there's a focus of well-being, focus on well-being, and understanding that school is important, but success requires more than just a focus on school. So what, what I'm gonna do is just identify 10 areas that I think we need to focus on. Uh, now that doesn't suggest that these are the only 10, right? Uh, but, but these are 10 that, that I'm not certain that we often think about. So number one, uh, we have to make sure and not give lip service to this notion of looking holistically at young people. And that means looking at the entirety of a young person's life. You know, not just what happens when they're in school, but what happens when they're not in school. Okay. Number two, we, we have to emphasize both in and out of school, the power of relationships, right? We know that all of the great educators during our most stressful periods in history understood that in order for young people to be successful, they had to make a personal investment in a young person's life, right? And, and every time I say that, people say to me, well, what, you know, what exactly are you, are you getting at? Well, I think the statement is clear. I think that anyone who's ever had the opportunity to work with young people understand that most of our young people are, are they want to know, do you care before they care about what you know? And so this idea of relationships is, is of paramount importance. Number three, uh, in order for children to arrive at school ready to learn, they need an array of essential supports and opportunities outside of school. You know, I travel around and, and I'm always amazed to hear people say to me, well, the young people aren't ready when they get to school. And, and you know, we could do a much better job if they were only ready. And that's always a kind of an interesting comment uh, because the way I think about schooling is if a young person arrives at the school door not ready in your eyes to learn, what better place to get ready than school? And so it occurs to me that yes, we've got to do more to support young people before the age of four. We need to look at their growth and development from birth on, but we also have to understand that as educators, we have a responsibility to be ready to give young people what they need, regardless of how they enter the school setting. Number four, Bell Hooks and Paulo Ferrer remind us that schools should be locations of possibility, right? We need to understand that when young people arrive at school, we as educators and community must be prepared 
to ensure that our schools and our classrooms are in effect locations of possibility. And that means that when we look at young people, we have to see possibility, right? And, and I dare say that some of the experiences that we've had over the last few years would suggest that we don't always see possibility in all of our young people. That also means that we need to make a major commitment, a recommitment to public education and and this additional funding is exactly what we need to ensure that every neighborhood school, not just some schools, every neighborhood school is a school where we would want our own children to attend. Number, number five is the, is the culture connection. We know that strengthening any student's sense of belonging in an education setting can only serve to further equip that young person to succeed. To develop belonging, a student needs to find commonalities with their own life and living situation. They need to see similarity in their own context. They need to know that the school identifies with them. The inclusion of cultural practice within an education curriculum can only develop a sense of belonging. For some students, it will be the sense of familiarity that they will respond to. For others, it might be the desire to know where they come from that will attract them. Providing the opportunity for students to know oneself and no one's heritage will ensure that students develop a strong sense of identity, self-confidence, and self-esteem. And I would uh, suggest to you uh, that self-identity, self-confidence, and self-esteem are precursors to success. Uh, number six, when we think about transforming our schools, we need to understand that what's needed is a simultaneous and coordinated focus on community education, economics, health, and human services. In other words, we have to do several things well at the same time, right? This is, this is not gonna be accomplished with just a focus on curriculum. This is not gonna be accomplished with just a focus on learning loss. We can't separate children from the family and we cannot separate family from the community. So we have to do several things well. Seven, the school is not and cannot be an institution apart from the community nor can it be the exclusive provider in a community education system. I mean, we, you know, some people say, well, you know, Dr. Young, we need more community schools. What, what I say is that we need to ensure that every school serves as the ecosystem within the larger community such that Schools provide whatever service a young person needs to be successful. Number eight, <clears throat> children and youth do well, obviously, when families do well. And so this whole notion of community development and school, and school development and family development have to be tied together. Nine, obviously, in this moment, of stress and trauma, children and youth need ongoing guidance and support in all developmental domains. 
And that needs to occur in a culturally responsive way. We have to be very careful. You know, people are saying, well, they just need more mental health services, or we just need more social workers, or we just need more, more, more. Uh, yes, we do need more, but it has to be done in a culturally responsive way, which means that we just can't assume that we know what it's like to be them. See, that takes hard work. Right? That takes study. That also takes what I call a system of confidence, trust, and respect. And, and those things are, are reciprocal. And, and the last one, uh, I would say, is, and it may be the first, is that equity and excellence go hand in hand. Uh, what, what amazes me over the course of my career is that I'm in many conversations about equity. And what I've noticed is that when we talk about some children, very rarely do we use the word equity and excellence in the same sentence. And so what I'm suggesting is that we can have no equity unless we have excellence. Uh, we are in an incredible moral moment. And what we do will impact generations to come. And now is the time to reshape public policy as well as public consciousness and institutions for the purpose of ensuring the survival, protection, and development of the next generation. The prevailing question is not what children and youth need to be successful, See, the evidence is clear. We know they need environments that support their cultural, social, emotional, physical, moral, language, civic, and cognitive development. We know that. The only question is, who is responsible for creating this environment? And I would answer, it is each one of us. Thank you. Um, um, thank you, um, Chancellor Young, for um, really providing today a multifocal lens that helps us, all of us, the stakeholders, to um, envision and redesign a new framework, a new ecosystem, as you well said, with equity and excellence um, while supporting those who are most vulnerable the children and their families um, in a holistic manner uh, so that everyone can reach uh, their potential. It really uh, just resonates that uh, we have a lot of hard work to do, but um, we're really at a, a wonderful uh, juncture in our communities. And um, I would like to, at this point, uh, not only uh, remind the audience members that we are going to hold off on, on we're now going to transition into um, the Q and A. So um, let's see. All right, thank you, Martha. So I'm going to um, take our questions now. Uh, we have a couple of questions, and thank you so much to Chancellor Young and to Congressman Bowman for those outstanding um, comments that you had shared. What I'm gonna do now is look through our questions. We have a, a lot of questions starting to come in. Um, one second, everybody. So Congressman Bowman, I'm gonna see, I think Congressman Bowman actually had to leave us um, for an, an, another commitment, but our questions are centering around a lot of different themes related to equity. The first one that I will ask is um, how can we ensure that money goes to areas for social emotional support um, and Chancellor Young would love to hear from you on that um, in terms of the funding needed to go to social emotional support and what that would look like. Well, uh, the, the first thing is uh, we know that in, in the American Recovery Act, uh, there are some designated funds that that will be used to support the social emotional um, development of young people. But one of the things I would, 
I would uh, say about that um, is the developmental pathways, they don't work in isolation. Uh, and, and we've got to be very careful that, uh, and, and, I have, and I have to be clear about this, that, that there's no evidence to suggest that just working on the social development or the emotional development of young people will help them completely overcome uh, stress, trauma. We, we need to be concerned with all of the developmental pathways, right? And so when we think about support, uh, it's really the idea of ensuring that we base our practice and our decisions on what we know about how young people grow and develop. We know, for instance, that when young people feel good about themselves, right? Uh, that they see them, they see and feel that they have the kinds of support um, when they need the support. Um, we, we know that when they see and feel that they have a future, um, when they know that they are surrounded by adults who care for them, and also look like them, you know, when they have an opportunity to experience um, what some have termed the value of insider knowledge, knowing how it feels to be you in a moment. Uh, we, we know that they're successful. We know that when they have opportunities to be creative, right, where, where they have opportunities to demonstrate success in a variety of areas, then it increases the likelihood that they will transfer those skills and motivation to other areas. And so what I would say to you is yes, uh, we need to be concerned and focused and yes, there's gonna be a significant amount of money targeted to social and emotional development. But we need to understand that we in school must be concerned with all of the developmental pathways. We need to look at physical development, uh, linguistic development, cognitive development, social, uh, emotional, uh, all of the pathways, moral development. You know, one of the one of the things that I talk with young people about all the time: what you are like as a person determines what you do with what you know. We all know that, and so it's important that we we think about character development. We we talk to young people about integrity. We talk to young people about why it's important to give back to the community and to help others. Uh, and, and so I would say that, yes, there's a significant amount, um, but think about how those funds are going to be used. What are those models that support, effective models that support the development of young people? And how do we use this in a way to, re to rethink the old models? Because that's the other problem. Uh, that we have to attend to is, is a recognition that the old way has not been a very helpful way. And so this idea of going back may not be um, in all of our best interests. I'm sorry for the, for the long-winded answer. <laughs> No, that was really, really um, a great answer. And I gave a lot of emphasis on so many different parts of this conversation. I wanted to ask you next, you know, continuing on the theme about funding, we know that property taxes are a really big part of the opportunity gap and, and the way that that permeates across school districts in Westchester and, and across the state. If you could speak a little bit to the role of property taxes and how, um, you know, the, the way that that varies as a funding source in, in the fight? Yeah. Um, well, look, without, without, without providing a, a history lesson, just, just very simply, as you know, 
And as the audience knows, uh, by constitution, education is a state responsibility. And um, I believe it was the Rodriguez decision in the mid seventies, which further established that it is all right for states um, to fund public education through property, ta property tax. And so, you know, what's the first thing that I would say is, is that that's an inequitable policy. That's a policy um, that is deeply rooted uh, in inequity. And just think, uh, by its very designation ensures th that you will have communities of haves and you will have communities of have nots. And so until that decision is challenged and remedied, um, this is going to be a challenge for public education uh, uh, across this nation. And so, you know, the notion of what do I think about it? <laughs> you know, I, as I said, I, I think that we um, have to look very carefully at what are the institutional um, structural uh, barriers that prevent large segments of the population from achieving an equitable um, education. And, and one of those is this whole issue of the way in which we fund public education. And I actually think that um, we should be encouraging our next crop of leaders and aspiring attorneys to begin to think through how that final decision, the Rod Rakes decision could be challenged uh, because that is at the heart of, of one of our uh, greatest education challenges uh, in America. That's a great, a great point of, as well um, on a little bit of elaboration on the funding structure and, and what needs to be done behind the scenes. The next question that we have, and we're getting more questions by the minute, so I recognize that we're not gonna get to everyone's question um, but we are recording the, the webinar, so we will have a log of the questions that we don't have and that we haven't had a chance to answer. Um, so we will, um, you know, encourage you, if we don't answer your question, to go on our website at wca4kids.org. And one of my colleagues can put it in the chat, the remote learning webpage, so that you can continue to engage if we don't get to your question. Um, our next question is about um, in your role as chancellor and everything that you've seen as an educator in your many 50 plus years um, about how to reconcile the poles of equity and accountability for education leaders, you know, in terms of equity on one side, um, in some cases, people see equity and accountability as, as opposites, but how do those blend together in leveraging equity and accountability to advance um, the opportunities for our children across Westchester? Well, I, I think, I think uh, the first thing you have to do is look at what your definitions are, right? Um, I, I think the conflict comes in, um, uh, accountability, uh, the, the way it's been interpreted um, during the period of high stakes testing, um, it's been interpreted as a search for the guilty mentality. Um, and so what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, with the advent of high stakes testing, we put lots of pressure on students, on schools and districts. And some person somewhere had the idea that uh, if we punish you for low scores, that will have an impact on improved outcomes. Uh, and here's what we now know. Uh, have, have the scores uh, improved over time? Uh, certainly the answer could be yes. Uh, but have the gaps uh, 
do the gaps still exist? The answer is yes. Um, and, and by the way, uh, I dare say, if you look at the numbers, um, the gaps will never disappear in my lifetime, uh, probably in, in none of our lifetime. And so a couple of things, I think we have to be very careful about how we um, define accountability. Now, if, if we see accountability as our strategy that, that says who is re first question, who's responsible and what are we responsible for? And if we use, build in with the accountability system, a vehicle that says, well, well, let's look at what's wrong and what needs to be changed and how do we actually help schools, um, then I think you stand a better position of getting closer to equity. Uh, but if, you, if we continue this practice of going out and making someone guilty, whether it's a superintendent whether it's a school district or whether it's a school board or whether it's a school a principal or students and or families, um, that's wrongheaded. And, and I would say uh, it is not designed to produce the kind of success that we all want for our communities. All right, thank you very much, Chancellor Young. We have time for about two more questions um, before we get to toward the end of our event. Um, our, one of the questions is gonna be, um, sorry, I'm finding it here right now. Do you have the ability, you know, from the education department, really looking at the imbalance between the number of social workers and psychologists in schools and the large numbers of school resource officers or safety officers um, in schools, particularly in urban, in urban settings. You know, looking at that, that um, trade-off between school psychologists and support workers, between that and um, public safety and um, school resource officers. Yeah, well, uh, I think you asked, do I have the authority? Uh, the, the, you know, many of those decisions, all of those decisions are, are local decisions. Uh, but, but what do we know? Uh, we know anecdotally, and we know um, by observation that what you describe is, is, not, um, is not evident in all schools, right? So there are some schools that I go into and, and they, uh, they have very few um, safety agents, if you will, in the schools. And when they are there, um, they engage in very humanistic practices. And what do I mean by that? You know, they, they call the students by their first name. They know who the students are, right? Um, they are there to be helpful. Um, in, in other school settings, uh, they operate um, like military or prison institutions um, where, where young people uh, are actually criminalized for youthful behavior. And so I think we've got to be very careful um, and boards and superintendents should be thinking through the kinds of policies that allow those situations to exist. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that when you build a culture of support for the development of young people, uh, you spend less time uh, managing behavior. The other point that I would make that, that uh, we shouldn't lose sight of is that the places 
uh, that spend more time focused on control and criminalizing children are the environments um, that serve communities of color. Uh, and, and so when that exists, uh, we need to have the hard conversations about why that exists. Uh, what is the history of it? What does that say about how we look at those communities and those students? And we should be prepared to call it out for what it is. And so that's the hard work. Uh, the good news is th that there are finally going to be sufficient resources to actually provide the kinds of supports that young people need. And so I want to be clear about this. I'm not suggesting that you sacrifice safety uh, for support. What I am saying is that it is our obligation to build a culture of support so that young people feel that there are other paths for them to engage in so that young people know that in every school, there's someone who looks out for them, right? There's someone who cares about them. There's someone who understands that they have a problem. You know, I spoke, and I'm, and, and I'm sorry if I'm taking too much time, but I spoke to a youngster recently, and he said to me, well, you know, in this moment of remote learning, uh, I log on, but I don't turn on my camera. And he said, you know, and every time I don't turn on my camera, my teacher deducts points for my grade. And I said, well, why don't you tur turn on your camera? He says, I don't want any, everyone else to see how I live. Um, and what I kept saying to myself, I didn't know this young man. And I didn't understand why people in the school didn't fix this, right? And so it is the decisions that we make cause young people to behave in particular ways. And I think we need to be able to examine what we do um, so that we can provide more supportive uh, environments for our young people. Hello again, everyone. Allison Lake, Executive Director of Westchester Children's Association. Thank you so much, Chancellor Young, for spending the time with us. Your 10 points really gave us all stepping stones, I think, to move forward on. I want to thank Representative Bowman, who did have to leave us earlier, but his office did suggest that we could pass on comments and questions to them to continue this conversation. And we certainly will do that to the questions that we did not get to today. I am really feeling energized and excited from the comments of our two speakers the importance of early childhood that Congressman Bowman mentions so that children are showing up to school ready to learn, the importance of the whole child and taking into consideration how policies and budgets impact them. I think your last example of the young man who didn't want to turn on their camera because of being embarrassed about um, his home situation is an excellent point of why we need to ask the why of our children and not be so quick to be punitive in that. I will remind everyone again to please sign our remote learning petition that gets to just some of these issues that we are working in partnership with community partners, with school districts, with our elected officials, with advocates, so that we can ensure what happens in the remote learning environment is supportive of kids and then once they are back in the school environment as well. We have a teachable moment here. This is a critical moment for all of us to really get it right. As I think our speaker said, as uh, Representative Bowman said, to reimagine what we want for our children and our students. So I um, encourage you to go to WCA's website. You see it here on the screen to learn more of what we're doing um, in the environment of education and equity. 
I want to thank again um, our um, community partners that helped introduce our speakers, Dr. Chase and Donna, Dr. Connolly. Really appreciate your support around this work. Certainly have to give a shout out to the WCA board members and my fierce staff for really making this morning um, possible. So I encourage all of you, as I said, these are stepping stones for us to continue some hard work and making some critical um, decisions that can impact and improve the lives of all our children, youth and young adults here in Westchester County. So I want to be very mindful of, of time. I think we're just at the 10 o'clock hour. Again, please put questions and comments in the chat so that we can follow up from you. Thank you so much, Chancellor Young, for really spending some time with us this morning, for digging deep with us. Appreciate it, and we will continue the conversation. Thank you, everyone, and hope you have a great day.